My name is uh, Khalil Sharif. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Aga Khan Foundation Canada, and it's a very uh, great delight to welcome you to the delegation of the Ismaili Imamat for uh, our session today. I want to, at the very outset of this event, uh, say a word of gratitude uh, first to CETA for their collaboration in supporting this uh, event, but also to the Micronutrient Initiative. Um, the MI uh, is probably the only Canadian uh, International Development Agency that has the distinction of being mentioned in, a, in the New York Times op-ed pages uh, as a real hidden gem uh, for doing the work uh, vitally important, uh, quietly and effectively for so many years. And it's a real delight to be able to be collaborating with them on this initiative and in fact having Lynn, who you'll meet in a few minutes uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the list uh, of panelists today. This is an important issue for us, uh, uh, the question of nutrition, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it clearly affects uh, the first years of life, which for us within the Alcon Development Network has become an incredible priority. It's one of those uh, issues where the knowledge in the, developing, in the developed world, the research base now about the first thousand days of life and the importance of those interventions um, is now well established. Um, that knowledge, uh, we feel, needs to be mobilized and translated into a set, a real programmatic agenda in the developing world. And it's one of those things that we think we can play a role in, is trying to be an intellectual bridge between these kinds of research findings, which are um, uh, so prevalent now in, in the developed world. In fact, Canada is at the forefront of some of this research and bringing it to bear on the issues uh, uh, in the developing world. Uh, it's also um, an interesting issue for us because it exhibits many of the traits of a complex, intractable problem. Uh, you'll know that of, of all the MDGs, the ones which are falling the, behind the most are those that have uh, to do with um, uh, malnutrition. And it tells us that this is an issue that requires a very specific kind of attention, a very specific kind of political, intellectual, and financial mobilization. Um, the inimitable Lawrence Haddad at IDS uh, uh, said that malnutrition reduction needs powerful champions who know how to get things done across government, avoid gobbledygook, and finish the story. And I'm very proud to say we've got a group of people here who will be able to do all those things, except for maybe the gobbledygook. <laughs> <laughs> I, will let you, I will let you decide. Um, the inciting incident for this panel has been the presence in Ottawa of Bob Black, who is uh, one of the most important leaders on this issue uh, in the world. Um, I'm not going to recite his biography in any detail because you've got it in front of you there. Um, suffice it to say that he ha now has uh, a, 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 another uh, of many enduring links to Canada because he was recently awarded the Canadian Gardener Award. Um, uh, and the citation for that award um, was for his significant contributions to improving child survival globally. And uh, there actually are very few people um, in, um, in the world who have applied more of their life uh, and more of their intellectual energy to uncovering the puzzles and promises of uh, child survival um, uh, uh, than Bob Black. So it's a very, very special pleasure for us to have Bob with us today. We also have a distinguished uh, set of panelists. This is how we're going to proceed. I'm going to invite Bob to say a few words to set the table, uh, and then um, uh, I will moderate a, uh, a bit of a discussion among our, amongst our panelists, and then we'll throw it open for, uh, for you to pose whatever issues that you want to um, uh, put forward, uh, and we'll try to wrap up by uh, around uh, 4.30, quarter to 5, and then we'll have some time for a reception. Um, afterwards where you can interact more informally with the panelists. So with that uh, uh, introduction, let me invite uh, Bob Black to uh, begin the conversation. Bob. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and, as you say, set us off on a discussion related to some of these problems on um, childhood nutrition, but uh, more generally maternal and child nutrition. And I include in that a number of aspects. Uh, we don't have time to talk about much of the detail, but, 
but stunting or short stature, which is an important marker for general nutritional and health conditions, as well as what has been referred to as hidden hunger, the deficiencies of vitamins and minerals, micronutrients, as they're called collectively. And, and uh, the focus here is on low and middle income countries, although these conditions sometimes do occur in uh, the more wealthy countries. Iron deficiency, for example, I think even zinc deficiency in some parts of the United States, particularly in the more recent immigrant populations. So these are in some ways global uh, conditions and global problems. The, the nutritional conditions in children, the undernutrition that we see around the world is the result of a number of different interacting um, problems that these children face. There may be um, nutritional problems of the mothers that affect fetal growth. Prior to and during pregnancy, nutrition is important. After birth, breastfeeding is critically important for nutrition as well as for prevention of infection. And um, subsequent complementary foods are also very important. And unfortunately, often the complementary foods are adequate not only in calories and protein, but also in the vitamins and minerals. So I am going to spend a little more time here talking about some of the vitamin and mineral aspects and focusing on, on two. Um, the, the consequences of these nutritional deficits or deficiencies are really uh, quite broad. And they include mental development and the fact that with these insults or these deficiencies, children do not reach their developmental potential. And they may, as adults, have reduced earning capacity and reduced productivity in society. And I'll come back and refer to that later in terms of the quantification that others have done. But in the short term, um, as the children grow, they also have, uh, these nutritional conditions also have very important consequences for illness. So they increase the rates of illness and the severity of illness and they increase the rates of death from those illnesses. And I'll refer particularly to two, the two major causes of death in children in the world, pneumonia and diarrhea. And the nutritional conditions that I'm gonna speak of, and I'll give you some numbers to back that up, really are very, very intimately involved with these two major causes of child death. In uh, 2008, our, our group that I, I helped coordinate published a series of estimates in regard to the consequences of these nutritional deficiencies. And we estimated at the time that undernutrition was the underlying cause, if you will, of about 35% of all the child deaths in the world. Now currently the estimate um, that we work with is about 7.6 million child deaths per year. So you can see this is a very large number that we're dealing with and I think a very large potential to have an impact if we could really solve these nutritional deficiencies and the problems. So I wanted to focus on two. Um, there are many essential vitamins and minerals. I won't recite them all here, and I can't deal with all the detail, but I do want to focus on two. And, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is they're very important, and two, there are some very direct connections to institutions and individuals here in Canada, and in Ottawa, in fact. So um, the two I wanted to focus on, um, one, one vitamin and one mineral, vitamin A and the mineral is, is zinc. When we did our estimates of the disease burden related to these two conditions, just these two uh, micronutrients, we estimated that, that the deficiencies of them resulted in about one million deaths of children per year. And th this is a very large number that we, we focus on, but in addition to the number of deaths, I think we need to focus on the fact that we have very powerful and very inexpensive interventions to reduce these deaths. So it's not just there's a lot of deaths, that's why we pay attention. We pay attention because we can actually virtually eliminate these deaths if we could implement the programs that we know now will be, will be effective. There were a number of trials. Um, now dating back some years, of high-dose vitamin A supplementation. And these trials um, collectively show that the deaths in children um, after six months of life could be reduced by about 20%. And that number may change a bit over time, but I think there's still a very, very large reduction if these vitamin A supplements are delivered appropriately to children. And they are now being delivered. Um, the programs that are very heavily supported uh, by CETA 
and supported technically by the Micronutrient Initiative are now uh, worldwide and achieving actually quite high coverage. The um, number of children who are supposed to get this, um, in fact, is, um, is very um, high, but, but the coverage of those who are actually getting it, getting the vitamin A supplements, is, is now quite uh, substantial, perhaps even 80% in most countries. So these, these programs, uh, as I say, have had substantial support and have been running for a good bit of time now. And I think during this time, one could easily say, and, and, and others have calculated, that the vitamin A supplementation programs have, um, have averted millions of deaths of children. So I'd like to turn now to another uh, micronutrient, zinc, and talk about why this is important and why we need to do further work on it. Um, zinc is an essential mineral, and that has been known for 50 years, actually, the 50th anniversary of that discovery in, in, um, in Iran and, and uh, Egypt was just last year. But for much of that time, it was really not appreciated how important it was, particularly how maybe less obvious, and again, the hidden hunger uh, term, uh, uh, forms or levels of zinc deficiency actually put ch children at risk of infectious disease. So these infectious diseases are very common. It wasn't immediately obvious how the zinc deficiency was linked to the infections. We, we started a series of trials really now about 20 years ago providing extra zinc and what that was able to demonstrate is that providing even a small amount of extra zinc, for example, in a daily supplement, was able to reduce the rates of diarrhea and the rates of, of pneumonia. So diarrhea rates went down by 25%, pneumonia down by um, about 35%. So very large, um, very large effects. And, and again, these are the two major causes of death. So we can, if we can affect those, we can have a major overall effect. The provision of a daily supplement is not so expensive, but it's also not so easy. And, and I think then we, we thought, well, if we could provide the zinc during a, an episode of illness, and we chose the diarrheal illnesses because we knew that, that there's an excess loss of zinc during diarrhea, and perhaps providing that extra zinc during diarrhea would have some benefit either on that episode or you know, restoring the zinc status of children so it would protect them from future problems. Well, in fact, fortunately, that turned out to be true. And after that uh, initial study or those studies, there have been now actually close to 50 randomized controlled trials. You might ask why so many, because we probably knew the answer about 30 trials ago. But people keep doing trials because they like to do that. Um, uh, so the trials are very, very consistent. If you give zinc during diarrhea, the duration of that episode is reduced by about 20%. And if you give it during the episode and continue that zinc for, the recommendation is, is 14 days or 10 to 14 days in, in some places. And if you continue that daily doses, dose of zinc for that time period, there is evidence that this not only reduces that episode duration and severity, but also prevents for some time period the uh, future development of diarrhea and, and pneumonia. So the follow-up of children after this treated episode found that there is um, there's also somewhere between 25 and 40 percent reduction of diarrhea and pneumonia after the episode, just treated with that 14 days of zinc. So those studies actually suggested um, um, you know, that there is a program here that is very possible to, live, to deliver and has both the therapeutic benefit and provides um, the treatment that, that mothers want in addition to fluid replacement, but also um, has that preventive benefit. So um, two, uh, two for one in that sense. So uh, recognizing the, um, the benefit, the World Health Organization and UNICEF in 2004 made a recommendation that all episodes of diarrhea in children in low- and middle-income countries should be treated with zinc. And that, um, that recommendation has been implemented in many countries. In fact, the policy to do that has been adopted now by almost all countries in Africa and Asia, less so, only a smaller fraction in Latin America. 
but um, the, the scale up, the implementation of that has been slower than one might hope. Um, I would say again, there's great leadership here because CETA is one of the funders of some of that scale up effort, not alone because there are others involved, other donor agencies and organizations, but, but again, the leadership here needs to be recognized. And again, the micronutrient initiative is um, playing a technical role in supporting countries in this, and I, I, I think that's uh, to their credit as well. So there's still a lot to be done. The, um, the use of zinc for treating diarrhea is not fully scaled up. There's, there's much more need to, to do that in many countries. But we have uh, the evidence that it works, and, um, and we know it can be, can be done. I'd like to conclude with some recommendations from economists. So I'm not an economist. I'm a child health person. But um, sometimes we, we need to bring in evidence of a different kind. And there's a group in Copenhagen called the Copenhagen Consensus Center. And what they do is every four years, they uh, develop position papers in regard to a wide array of development interventions and investments, trade agreements, you know, infrastructure of various kinds, water and sanitation, health programs, nutrition. And so every four years, they, they convene a group of uh, Nobel laureate economists to sit and review all this material and make a set of recommendations. And in um, 2008, their uh, recommendations, after looking at all this, said that vitamin A and zinc was the number one investment that the world should make in, um, in regard to development. And they're not just interested in uh, in the health consequences. That's important, but they're interested in the development consequences. They're interested on the return on that investment. And when they, they did this um, exercise again earlier this year, they concluded that, in fact, a package of nutrition interventions was still number one. This was a little broader package. It include, included vitamin A and zinc for, for treating diarrhea. It also included some other measures to reduce chronic malnutrition. But their estimate as economists was that for every dollar invested in that, um, in that program, or that package, there was a $30 return to that society, to that country, in, um, in economic development because of the increased human capacity that was, was generated by better nutrition. So I, I think we have moral arguments, we have economic arguments, and we have uh, uh, the means to deliver these interventions to populations in need and make a tremendous difference. And I think we're collectively, um, I think, committed and engaged in that. So I'm, I'm quite pleased and honored, in fact, to participate in this panel with representatives of some of the organizations that are making this happen, and al also with my colleague, uh, Dr. Buis, who's going to make the future happen with some of his new interventions, um, because uh, I think we're, we're, we're dealing with both the need in the short term and then in the very long term to, to also um, address the nutritional problems, perhaps in different ways than, than we're able to do now. So I look forward to the discussion today.